Welcome to the Institute for the Study of Liberation Theology. My name is Alexander Holmes Brown, and this is our first video, so I'm giving it a go. I'm nervous, I'm not used to being on YouTube, I don't like being in front of camera, but I think it's time to get this information out here. So welcome, our first video, Enrique Dussel, his perspective on Puebla 1979, but moreover the Puebla event, which goes from the years preceding and goes on into the years afterwards. I'm excited to present this. It's based upon a written text, which you'll find in the links below and on the website. Uh, I encourage everybody to join us, hit the subscribe and like, but also please come and contribute to the archive, the process, the idea of getting these stories of our ancestors, our people, our heroes of liberation theology, down on page, down in video for our next generation. The Third General Conference of the Latin American and Caribbean Episcopal Conference, CELAM, Consejo Episcopal Latinoamericano y Caribeño, in Spanish and Portuguese, is known as Puebla for short. It's named after the location, just as the Second General Conference is remembered as Medellin. If Medellin in 1968 represented the Latin American Roman Catholic Church's turn towards the poor and exploited majorities in recognition of the call to be on the side of those who are unjustly treated, well, Puebla in 1979 represented the battleground within the church over what that commitment should look like. Here we pour over Enrique Dussel's interpretation of the Puebla Conference and the surrounding events the combination factors, the forces and counterforces that he calls the Puebla event. The Puebla event is more than the text from the conference, and it's more than what took place between January 27th and February 13th, 1979. It's the currents and cross-currents, the battle for interpretation, the ongoing legacy, and the experience of the theologians of liberation as they fought for life while facing death all around. I'm using the 1981 English translation of his Historia de la Iglesia en América Latina, which I think was originally from 1974, but it's gone through many revisions. I'll link you to some of those revisions. You can see how many in Spanish and English and other languages it has done. But what we are using today is, and every quote today is from A History of the Church in Latin America, Colonialism to Liberation, 1492 to 1979. Alan Neely translated that so beautifully for Erdmund in 1981. The history of the Third Bishop Conference in Puebla may be said to have begun in 1973. Early in that year, it was reported that observers have noted statements made by Bishop Lopez Trujillo, the new Secretary General of Salem in Rio de Janeiro at the beginning of this year to mean that there may be no Third Conference for the present. During the same period, there was talk about valid and invalid interpretations of Medellin. One Mexican bishop said, The talk about Medellin is different from what really happened. If read carefully, Medellin commitments do not require the church to side with the poor. But a new ideological base had to be established in order to ignore that first conference. Now, before continuing Spanish readers are directed to pages 385 onwards of the Glasgow upload, that's below, and then English readers, you are directed to pages 230 onwards, the Spanish one. This is the whole book uploaded, okay? This is by Clasco, the Consejo Latino Americana de Ciencias Sociales. We're lucky to have it. English readers, yours here is just chapter 11, but you can find all the rest online on Enrique Dussel's own website or on Clasco. So 230 onwards there. Let's continue. On November the 30th, 1976, Salem was charged with organizing the Third Bishops' Conference, the beginning of a long journey which would end February 13th, 1979, so it did end up coming to be. These and two some years later allowed the church in Latin America and also around the world to recognize the importance of an event which would affect directly or indirectly the orientation of the church on other continents. What was taking place in the Americas mattered everywhere. 
Christians there had just outnumbered Christians in Europe in 1975, and soon enough Latin America would be where nearly half of the world's Catholics lived. In typical Dussel style, the preparatory period is segmented in the four parts, four epochs. Number one, November 1976 to November 1977, convocation until working draft. Number two, November 1977 to September 1978, the appearance of the working draft to the final countdown. September 1978 to the 27th of January 1979 represent the third epoch, the final countdown to the conference start. And number four, we have January the 27th to February the 13th, 1979, the conference itself, Puebla, the third general conference of CELAM. Before stage one, already Bishop Lopez Trujillo, the Secretary General of Salem since 1972, was already making the liberation theologian suspicious of what he was up to. Evidence that the reactionary networks were planning a traditionalist agenda for the Third Bishops' Conference appeared in the form of the Colombian Bishops' document, Christian Identity, November 1976, and then also the conclusions of a meeting in Buenos Aires in 1977, in July the 2nd to the 8th, it was organized by invested conservative laymen. The consensus of both of these, Latin America was following the capitalist path in its urbanization and industrialization, and this was a good and proper thing, with a few caveats and warnings about the excesses of violence and poverty, but basically this was a good thing. The theology, philosophy and sociology of liberation movement was already well beyond idealizing this kind of development, increasing underdevelopment. The structural poverty of Latin America was, for them, part and parcel of the development, the enrichment of the corporations that so-called developed, and we should read, exploited Latin America in the capitalist model. What happened to the prophetic denouncements of the Second Bishops' Conference in Medellin? It was apparent that some influential factors within the church wanted to turn back the clock and steer against the criticism launched by the Liberationist School against developmentalism. Straight away, Seeing the writing on the wall, these networks mobilized. Dussel says, the bases began to organize when they discerned what was happening, and they awaited the publication of the working draft. Their suspicions proved to be well-founded. The long 1,159-paragraph text run counter to the Medellin Conference presupposed a developmentalistic, even trilateral theoretical framework, and was quite restrained, if not ambiguous, in its condemnation of transnational firms, national security regimes, and the violation of human rights. In January 1978, there began the most important counteroffensive in the history of Latin American theology, not only did theologians take part, but also bishops, groups of bishops, priests, religious-based communities, peasants and Indians. It was an unplanned, spontaneous act of repudiation of the working draft. In America appeared alternative documents. Bishop Marcelo Pinto Cavajera and a liberationist stronghold in the Brazilian Northeast produced their contributions to reflection. And from Venezuela, they circulated Una Buena Noticia, La Iglesia Nace del Puebla Latinoamericana. From around the world came alarm from Catholics who supported the work done in Medellin. Over 70 theologians met in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and voices rang out from every European country and from North America. Internationally, the memorandum issued November 21, 1977 from progressive West German theologians raised the stakes. The names of the signers included Johannes Baptist Metz, Karl Rana, Jürgen Moltzmann, Norbert Greinacker, Helmut Gowitzer, Martin Niemuller, Walter Dirks, Herbert Vorgrimler, Paulus Engelhardt, and Ernst Kaiserman. The church world over took notice of what was involved in a church conference in Latin America. I want to say a little bit about some of these names as well. Helmut Gowitzer, he took over Martin Niemuller's pastorate when the latter was in prison in Sachsenhausen and Dachau. They were both part of the confessing church. As for Ernst Kaiserman, his daughter Elizabeth Kaiserman, a human rights activist, disappeared, was abducted in Argentina on March 9, 1977, and her tortured body was left on the streets on May the 23rd. As for Jürgen Moltmann, many of you know his open beef, his open letters directed at Jose Miguel Bonino and Hugo Asman and others. No matter his gripes with the liberation theologians from Latin America, he has signed in support of their cause and against those who would derail it. 
Speaking of which, in that year, 1977, Jürgen Moltmann toured Latin America. He started in Argentina at Is It Dead, where Jose Miquez Bonino was, and he ended his tour at a great conference in Mexico. Um, I have the book here from that conference, Praxis Cristiana y Producción Teológica. It's by Jorge V. Pixley and Jean-Pierre Bastian, or they're the editors, I'd rather say. Now, this one's not being translated to English. Um, I'm working on it, and I've uh, graciously been sent the PDF from the seminary. If anyone wants to help translate this, they can. Jürgen Moulton was there. James Cohn was there. Alfred North Whitehead was there. Harvey Cox was there. It's a really important piece of the history. But back to our conference today, Puebla. Cardinal Aloysio Lorscheid, well known for his work at the National Conference of Brazilian Bishops and President of CELAM since 1976. At this point, he took back a little power, at least nominally for the liberationists, assuming responsibility from this point for the task of writing the agenda for the third conference. Although, Dussel says Riley, with ample collaboration, i.e. Secretary General Lopez Trujillo and gang exerting their pressure on every paragraph. Even with the sympathetic Loshida at the helm, he's often enough listed among the liberation theology lineup, none of the theologians of liberation were admitted to the next draftings. Dusa says it like this, It was as if Karl Rana, Ives Conga, and other prominent European theologians had been excluded from the Second Vatican Council. Of course, he says, certain reactionary factions did try to exclude them. With this delay, due to the controversy surrounding the initial working draft, but moreover due to the death of Pope Paul VI on 6 of August 1978 and his successor, Pope John Paul I, on 28th of September, there was more time still for leaks and disclosures about the additions and exclusions that took place during the preparations, such as the letter sent from Bishop Lopez Trujillo to a colleague, where he says, Prepare your bombers for Puebla and get training before entering the ring for the world match. Among all that was at stake for the church, the watching news media, the theologians of liberation and their traditionalist enemies, and all of the social classes who wished the church's blessing and legitimation of their strivings, was the election of a new pope after the untimely death and quick succession of Paul VI and John Paul I, the election of the conservative Polish cardinal Karol Joseph Walzer, who would become Pope John Paul II on 16th of October 1978 must have come as some relief for Bishop Lopez Trujillo and for Father Roger Veckermans, who had parted ways with the liberation theologians early on, maintaining the developmentalist anti-revolutionary line as editor of journal Tierra Nueva, which Vulture as a cardinal had received and been primed by on the Latin American situation since perhaps as early as 1972. So this is what the ring, the world match looked like. Bishops were divided by class loyalties, different ideologies and even national blocs. Some wanted a conference to condemn their version of the popular church, liberation theology, the so-called parallel magisterium and Marxist social analysis for sure. Others supported the church's experience in the base communities and identification with the poor and espoused the denunciation of national security regimes transnational economic expansion and the violation of human rights. The delegations from Argentina, Colombia, Mexico and finally Venezuela formed a conservative bloc in Puebla. The Brazilian bishops and those from Peru, Central America, the Caribbean and Ecuador as well as others defended the church's commitment to the repressed people of the continent. So it was that things started to gather in Mexico towards the end of 1978 in preparation for the showdown in Puebla. I'll say more about the atmosphere of the conference in another video. For now, let us continue with Dussel's interpretation of the documents that came out of the conference and with the speeches and interventions that came from the new Pope. Although we're not going to follow so closely as to replicate Dussel word for word, I want rather to comment on some of his comments, interpret his interpretations. Dussel's slant is noticeable. It should be said, and often has been by commentators, that the official pronouncements of the church are always open to interpretation. Just as certain forces wish to use Puebla to neutralize Medellin, the liberation theologians have utilized the Third Bishop's Conference final documents as best as they could ever since. 
Likewise, for the visit and pronouncement of the Pope preceding the conference. Dussel is not shy about this and almost seems to write with a wink and a nod. That at least that's how I read him. So, like here, here and with me. The arrival of Pope John Paul in Santo Domingo on January 25th, two days prior to the beginning of the conference in Puebla, attracted worldwide attention. During his trip to and from Mexico, the Pope gave over 40 addresses sometimes arousing heated commentaries and obliging the bishops to make a careful exegesis. Although officially excluded from the conference, the liberation theologians were invited by several bishops as consultants, and their presence was felt at once. On the very afternoon of the first session, a 16-page commentary on the Pope's inaugural address was already available to the bishops. His own exegesis of Pope John Paul II's speeches are an argument from absence. The Pope gave no substantial support to the old idea of Christendom. He said nothing to imply that the church should be situated in political society, allied with the upper classes or dependent on the state in its pastoral function. Naturally, the politicians and power brokers, bankers and the Mexican bourgeoisie were surprised and perhaps frightened by the Pope's popular appeal and they interpreted his words in the neo-Christian model. Within a few days, however, it became clear that he was supporting neither capitalism nor condemning socialism, but rather demanding freedom for the church and its mission under both systems. His meaning was not quickly grasped, but of the words that found their way into the final Puebla document, those of John Paul II are the most pastoral passages and clearly express the support for the poor. Now compare that to Paul E. Sigmund, who was writing in Crisis magazine when he said, the Pope criticized the politicization of the gospel message, decried the effort to promote a people's church in opposition to the institutional church, and called for a Christian concept of liberation that could not be reduced simply to the restricted domain of economics, society, and culture. Sigmund, a sympathetic but critical commentator on liberation theology, describes the relationships between official pronouncements, church congresses, and the individuals shaping and shaped by them, as well as that trajectory from Medellin to the Puebla event. He says this, The liberation theologians outside the meeting worked tirelessly, criticizing speeches and draft resolutions, and replying to attacks on their views. The result was a final document, which could only be described as a draw. It condemned the politicization of theology and a praxis that has recourse to Marxist analysis, but it was also critical of liberal capitalism and of the doctrine of the national security state used by current military regimes to justify their rule. More important, Puebla made a decisive commitment to the preferential option for the poor, which was to be almost as controversial in future discussions as Medellin's reference to institutionalized violence was. That commitment was described by the conference as non-exclusive in order to diffuse criticisms of its possibly partisan or even Marxist, the poor versus the rich character. But it committed the Latin American church more clearly than in the past to work with the poor, as the liberation theologians had urged. The press covered the battle between the pro and anti-liberation bishops as if it were in fact the prize fight alluded to by Lopez Trujillo. The reporters were disappointed that the final outcome was not a decisive victory for one side or the other, but they should have known from past meetings that an effort would be made to fashion a consensus document with something for everyone. I think um, I think Dussel would agree with that. In a paragraph, one sentence feels triumphal until the very next sentence he brings it home. The trouble, replete with the contradictions of the Puebla event, he can say, the groups that attempted to condemn the popular Christian movements, the base communities, the popular church, the Latin American theology of liberation and the so-called parallel magisterium failed in their objective and were completely defeated, at least at the conference. Those who attempted to muffle the voice of the Latin American church in order to avoid being made uncomfortable by its denunciations achieved their ends. Because in the last analysis, little was said at Puebla that was not later neutralized to a larger extent by compromise. The Puebla document was therefore distinct from that of Medellin, for even though there were many sections of the Medellin statement that lacked clarity, none was weak, insipid, or inarticulate. Furthermore, the real losers, namely the popular groups, the base communities, the theologians of liberation, and the prophetic bishops, 
Well, they took control of the situation and evidence of faithfulness to the church that enabled them to leave Menachin strengthened and encouraged. His first takeaway from the document begins with the inaugural message and it's the people of God. The phrase Puebla is used again and again in Puebla. It's the most frequently used word in the whole document and Dussel recalls Lumen Gentium, the Vatican II document that today's Pope Francis has championed. Dussel then does his exegesis on a passage therein which invites everyone without class distinction to accept and assume responsibility for the cause of the poor as if it were your own cause and the very cause of Christ himself. Well, Dussel doesn't make it any clearer when he points to the emphasis on the position of class as taking up the cause of the oppressed as over against every class situation when they say without class distinction. It doesn't get any clearer. It's the compromise. But he does say in one of his moments of his most beautiful clarity, love, love for the poorest of God's children is the beginning of Christianity. He next shares a passage from the introductory text which celebrates the intrepid strugglers for justice, evangelists for peace. Antonio de Montesinos, Bartolome de las Casas, Juan de Zumarraga, Vasco de Quiroga, Juan del Valle, Julio Garcés, Jose de Ancheta, Manuel Nobrega, and Antonio Valdivieso. I hadn't known until now that this was Bartolome de las Casas' first official welcome by the church, as my introduction to Latin American religious life had been from inception through the writings of liberation theology and the writings of liberation theology never stopped celebrating him. I suppose I had imagined that even the right wing of the church could, in the same way that they worship Jesus while making more crosses for the crucified, acknowledge the noble cause of the defenders of the Indians from the 16th century, even as they exploit and murder indigenous people and their descendants today. Other firsts, Dussel notes, are the references to the role of women in the life of the church, and a recognition that indigenous peoples and Afro-Americans were suffering the most abject poverty, though Medellin had already suggested something of this. Preceded that same year by a meeting in Melgar, Colombia, which transformed the outlook of those who attended, this was the first pastoral meeting of indigenous missions, 1968, Medellin's document 6 validated the religion of the poor and advocated a pastoral program that actually comprised of festivals, sanctuaries and celebrations. He writes elsewhere, popular religion was now respected as a form of popular resistance, an area of creativity, religious and cultural. Under this program, Afro-American religions like voodoo from Haiti and Mokumba from Brazil were rehabilitated and the vitality of Native American religions rediscovered. Through Salem, a department of indigenous priesthood and education was established, along with training centers such as Senami in Mexico and several priests, including Bishop Leonidos Proaño in Rio Bamba, Bishop Samuel Ruiz in Chiapas, and Bishop Yaguno among the Tarahumaras, spoke and struggled on behalf of the indigenous people. The renaissance of the Amerindian people, beginning in the 1960s, was in part a major success for the church. This new world of marginal, oppressed and poor groups linked to the church justified the positions adopted at Medellin in Puebla, a church for the poor was born in creative tension with members of the ecclesiastical institution who tended to adopt a conservative alliance with established power groups and sought the strengthening of the hierarchy's control of the ecclesiastical apparatus in response to firm leadership from Rome. This tension increased during the 1980s and culminated in a period of restoration of middle-class ecclesiastical movements. We will say more on the role of women in the life of the church at Puebla, where they were excluded uh, not only from the conference, but from the counter conference of excluded liberation theologians too. We'll be doing that in another video with a reflection from Rosemary Radford Ruther, who was there in support of sisters in South America, Latin America, the Caribbean. Dussel contrasts a Brazilian church model to the Colombian or Argentine models when he quotes passages on the sin, the evil of unjust structures, paragraph 1258, and the call for the church to become more independent of the powers of the world in order to take advantage of the freedoms that exist which allow for her completion of her apostolic labor without interference, paragraph 144. You see he's contrasting the Brazilian church 
free from the state, free to criticize the state and the Colombian or Argentine models, which are part and parcel of the state, hampered by the state. So when the documents condemn simplistic Christologies that have identified Christ as a revolutionary or political leader, as well as theoretical and hypothetical rereadings of the Gospels, this is Dussel's paraphrasing of paragraph 178 and going forward. Well, Dussel claims that in this regard, the theology of liberation is not only in agreement with, but has functioned as a vanguard of this very position. He laments a lacking other half missing from this orthodoxy, though. That's the praxis, the political function of the prophetic and priestly Christ missing from the documents. I hadn't known until now that the Puebla documents name the theology of liberation head on. But in addressing the so-called popular church, I think Church of the People is a, the best translation for popular church, by the way. It condones the attempt to identify with the popular movements of the people, as has always been intended by the theology of liberation and experience of the Conference of Bishops. Read this as an affirmation of Meijin. Dussel reads this as, The popular church now has a green light if it reproduces the incarnation in popular ways. It should be condemned, however, if it proposes to be a church distinct from the official and institutional church, but has never been thus understood by those who are committed to the poor in Brazil, Peru or Mexico. The assertion that the popular church is schismatic is simply a false accusation made by those who really desire to undermine this incarnation in popular ways. Paradoxically, it has been these accusers who are being condemned. As the saying goes, they went out to shear, they returned sheared. And the Pope himself is called upon by Dussel for these surprising declarations. This is from Pope John Paul II in Rome on February the 21st, 1979, the same year. We should call by its name whatever social injustice, whatever discrimination, whatever violence is inflicted on the body, spirit or conscience of a human being. We should call it by its name injustice, the exploitation of a person by another person and the exploitation of a person by a state and the economic systems. And even more, a validation from the, the same Pope of liberation theology. He says, the theology of liberation insists that human beings not only should be instructed in the word of God, but also speaks of their social, political and economic rights. The theology of liberation refers at times exclusively to the situations in Latin America, but we should recognize the demands of a theology of liberation for the whole world. But the utility of this for the theologians of liberation facing ever increasing violence at home and future censuring from that same Pope leaves an ambivalent impression. Is not the verbal validation of a theology of liberation in combination with the concrete barring of the theology of liberation's main spokespeople, not the exact subversion that Lopez Trujillo and Roger Veckermans especially were tasked with, in the latter case with funding from US intelligence to do so. Still, Dussel takes in his book, and we must remember when it was written and released and expanded to include these years up to 1979, and so he's writing tactfully on the matter. But in his book, he takes this sympathetic, hopeful view of the pontiff, who's a new pontiff at this point. Some of us expected these words from the Pope. The news media, and especially the writers outside and inside the church, had misrepresented his thinking, for he has an extraordinary sensitivity to the poor, and will understand sooner or later the profound spiritual pathos of our theology. I suppose my own interest and motivation for doing this work, developing this kind of archive called the Institute for the Study of Liberation Theology is, besides a purely historical interest, one to do with my own rearing in this movement, while trapped it seemed inside of a more conservative, evangelical world, and the discovery not of an ideology, I mean there was that too, but of a human connection to these authors who were writing from their own connections to the humans they loved and ministered among. Not much of a theologian myself, I've always been primarily interested in the life stories of the theologians of liberation, their motivations. That's why I spent so much time recently on a biography of Dussel that spends time specifically on his emerging self-understanding. It's just a little biography uh, and it really goes even from his childhood. There is a story Dussel shares next, which I'll simply link to in the Spanish and in the English. It's always surprised me that the graciousness and carefulness with which most of the theologians of liberation have spoken about the bishops of Rome. Even Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, and even after the major condemnations of 1986, 
One can speculate the measures of carefulness versus kindness in their humility, given their endangered situation. Dussel wrote the above, for example, while in exile, because his home was bombed. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm surprised again and again at their patience with regards to their own lots, their own suffering. That, scene, that sort of patience about what they went through, only matched by their prophetic impatience over the lots apportioned the poor and exploited people that they ministered with and amongst. In its key of the preferential option for the poor, an option has a connotation of choosing, I mean opting actively for the poor person's side in a concrete situation of exploitation by a person or a system. In its key of the preferential option for the poor, um, those denied the most basic material goods, written paragraph 1135, there's a challenge to materialism which sets forth alternative solutions to the consumer society, paragraph 1152. Dussel sees here a rejection of capitalism, even if the fundamental question of what alternatives is left untouched. On the text piece, Dussel sees the fingerprint of Gustavo Gutierrez, who despite his official exclusion, was more influential than many of those who were present. Dussel highlights a text of Commission 21 which unflinchingly states there are obvious contradictions between the unjust social order and the demands of the gospel, paragraph 1257. That the broad hopes for development have not been realized, paragraph 1260. And it condemns the domination of the rich nations over the poor nations, paragraph 1264. The wealth and power of the multinational corporations, paragraph 1264. And the lamentable situation of the isolated, the refugees and the exiled, paragraph 1266. In view of this sinful situation, there arises the need for the church to denounce evil objectively, valiantly and evangelically paragraph one two six nine now part of the exchanges surrounding the puebla event were the open letters sent by bishops to one another two examples are given by dussel in which the letters serve ostensibly to uplift one bishop and kind of subtly condemn another or others one sent to oscar romero who was shot dead the next year anointed his pastoral activity in the archdiocese of san salvador at a time in which the chastisement, the veritable persecution, began. Adding, accused and defamed along with those who search for ways of justice, you have remained steadfast, knowing that you have to obey God rather than men. Which surely means the churchmen as much as the military men who required Romero's silence. One sent to Monsignor Manuel Salazar of Leon, present at Puebla, was really a way to publish the same group of bishops' support for Monsignor Obando y Bravo of Managua, who was absent. I don't know to what extent Salazar was a supporter at that time of the Sandinistas, who would take power later that year, 17th of July 1979, but along with Bishop Obando y Bravo and Bishop Leo Vigildo López from Granada, he would negotiate with the dictator Somoza for the demands of the FSLN. The group either way wrote to him with their reassurance that he is denouncing the horror with a prophetic valor. That group, for those of you who like me want to know just who is where, when and doing what, their names are Bishops Santiago Benitez from Paraguay, Candido Rubens Padin from Brazil, Helda Camara from Brazil, Fernando Aristia from Chile, Ramon Ovidio Perez from Venezuela, Gerardo Flores from Guatemala, Paulo Arns from Brazil, Moesir Greci from Brazil, Jorge Manrique from Bolivia, Manuel Talamas from Mexico, Adriano Hippolito from Brazil, Luciano Metzinger from Peru, Luis Bambaren from Peru, Leonidas Proano from Ecuador, Carlos Palmes from Bolivia, Luis Patino Santa Coloma from Colombia, and many others. Dussel sees a final document of the Puebla event as merely one segment in the historical process that has only begun, and thus the text becomes a quarry in which an admixture of marble of superior and inferior quality, simple stone, dirt and clay are discerned and discernment is underpinned by popular praxis. This is not a Machiavellian misuse of the text, nor an intentionally misrepresented reading, says Dussel. On the contrary, it allows for the discriminate use of the better texts by the people of God and the utilization of these texts 
for the common good. For Dussel, if Puebla is to provide what the popular ecclesial praxis needs of her, it will be, as Medellin has been, a witness not in the seminary, but in the thousands of ecclesial-based communities, among the thousands of martyrs, in the torture chambers and in the oppressive courts. Medellin became actualized, historical and significant in the popular ecclesial praxis. The popular appropriation of Puebla by the people to whom it belongs naturally is the most pressing task. Whereas in 1968 Salem surrendered the sessions and the texts they produced to the prophetic groups, the battle over Puebla which can be discerned in the contradictions of the text means the appropriation by the people is a task requiring work, the dissemination and explication of the texts that are usable for liberation. So it is that Dussel finishes his concise treatment of the Puebla event. Medellin was born in the hearts of the oppressed. This was not the case in Puebla, which is given birth by those who appear to have resisted the idea that the third conference be a popular Christian event. The apparent intention was to bury Medellin and to consign in limbo many of the questions related to the church committed to the poor. But this attempt failed. The text of Puebla, the quarry text, contains many precious stones and an abundance of marble. We should avoid the historical mistake of allowing Puebla to be appropriated by the dominant classes, by the national security governments, or by those elements in the church that are not committed to the poor. It would be a crime to surrender the Puebla text for which so many in the Christian community have struggled and labored in their hundreds of meetings, demonstrations, writings, and sufferings. This text would not be willingly surrendered. The people have the right to the Puebla text. They should constitute the historical reality. For Dussel, there's more work to do. He says, The fact is that the meeting in Puebla has not ended. It has only begun, and the effects will be determined by what results from the conference. If the Christian community appropriates the good that has come from Puebla, the church will be purified, and Puebla will be the new Medellin. We will be the one who determine the impact of Puebla. So that was the first video, uh, my first attempt for the Institute of the Study of Liberation Theology that was Enrique Dussel on the Puebla event. Uh, be sure to like the video, be sure to subscribe. I love your comments, your insights, any advice about YouTube as well, about content creation on here. Our next video is gonna be on Puebla again. Rosemary Bradford Ruther, who was there, who was meeting with women who were excluded not only from the conference, but also from the counter-conference, from the excluded liberation theologians themselves, all men. After that, sticking with this super important event in the history of liberation theology, which we're coming up to the 45th anniversary of, we're gonna dive into this little booklet with contributions from John Sabrino, Francis McDonagh, Pope John Paul himself, and the great journalist, Julian Fulokowski. Stay tuned.